In the late 1960s, a new type of music sprang up in the UK. It was dubbed progressive rock, and by the 70s, groups such as Yes and Emerson, Lake and Palmer were huge attractions, noted for grand concepts and even grander stage shows. The bubble burst in the late 1970s, when these bands were accused of being rock dinosaurs, but they survived and were given a new lease of life in the 80s and 90s. This is the story of some of the biggest bands of the progressive rock era. One of the bands that spearheaded this new music was The Nice, featuring a young Keith Emerson. But their origins were far from the sounds of progressive rock. They started life as a backing band for soul singer and ex Kett, P.P. Arnold. Keith and I went to a club called the Cromwellian one night and we were approached by P.P. Arnold's roadie and driver, a guy called Mickey O. He says, oh, I'm looking, been looking for you too. He says, P.P. Arnold's got that hit first cut. She, she just wants to go out on the road and she doesn't like the band she has at the moment. Uh, she wants a young kicking band, you know, do you fancy having a go? And we said, oh, give that a try, you know. Even though I named them the nice, they always had their own music and their own thing. And, uh, and it was great watching them develop that, and that was all different, you know, with Keith, with all their influences. So their music, the nice, would come on and open up for me, and they would do the whole nice thing. The nice sounded so different that Andrew Oldham, owner of Immediate Records, wanted them to go solo. While I was home in the States, Andrew stole my band. <laughs> The band, now out on their own, was searching for a new sound by experimenting with influences other than rock and roll and developing a dramatic presentation. We'd take a basically classical thing and put a thumping great beat behind it, and, or even sometimes no beat at all, but it, would, it was classical or contemporary classical music with a rock and roll feel to it. Isn't it? I'd always felt frustrated sitting behind this piece of furniture, which is really what a an organ is. You can't move around like a guitar player. You can't sort of do the, the tongue thing. And finally, one silly night, he jumped over it. What's he doing? <laughs> the fight broke out in the audience, and there's all these French guys smashing shit out of each other. And I joined in, and I really with the Hammond organ on stage. I started shaking it and exploded and boing, you know, and then eventually lifting up, smashing it on the stage. And then the fight stopped in the audience and they looked up, what the hell is he doing? And then came the knives. And he kept rhythm by throwing them into his Leslie cabinet. It was one of those revolving amplifiers that Hammond had. Of course, some nights he'd forget to sharpen them and they'd come bouncing out and hit various members of the band, its road crew, and once even landed in the lap of poor some lady in the front row who passed clean out. <laughs> the Nice weren't the only ones combining progressive rock and stage theatrics. Singer Arthur Brown was noted for it. This was drummer Carl Palmer's first exposure to a new type of rock show. The show would start off with Arthur with this huge womb would roll out onto stage. Centre stage would be eight foot in diameter and he would come out from the middle of it 
with all this stretch cloth and dressed up like a boat. And it was an in incredible sight at the time. It was so far in front of everybody, you know. I am the god of hellfire, and I bring you fire. Arthur's trademark was a flaming headdress which he would wear while singing his hit single, Fire. But designing it had proved to be a problem. The fire helmet was actually at that point a vegetable colander with candles on it. But that proved impossible because as the wax came down it would go through the holes and stick it to your, to your hair. So we moved on from that. Fire. I'll take you to learn. The next step was to get a pastry dish with the like red piping rim, put a screw to the top of it, um, screwed it onto a leather strap, and then it went under my chin. But of course, I was somewhat difficult to chin with, and also the heat would come down the screw onto my skull, so it was very, very painful. But boy, did it make a big. <laughs> Of course, also, the, the lights man was given to being drunk, and he was the one who poured the, the gasoline in, so he would slop it over my shoulders, I would catch fire, I mean, it was, uh, people loved it. Around this time, classically trained keyboard player Rick Wakeman was playing with the group The Straubs. He found himself on the same bill as Arthur Brown at an unusual gig, a combination of rock show and circus. What you did, you played to the different acts. So they had Arthur Brown playing to the trapeze artist, because that was all action. We as Straws were playing for the child jugglers who dropped everything. Arthur Brown uh, only actually did one show because he came on with his hat on fire, and the goddamn fire split his trousers and they arrested him. And so he was taken away. The Straws didn't fare any better than Arthur. I had one solo. One little electric piano solo, and like most musicians, you waited all night for your own little solo, despite the fact that nobody listened, you waited all night. And it came to my solo, and suddenly there's a bit of a cheer from the crowd, and there was this old boy on stage with a big handlebar moustache, waving his stick, and, there, and I thought, who's this old git that's come on stage? So I pushed him off. Um, um, it, well, the police arrested me. Um, I didn't know it was Salvador Dali. <coughs> The progressive movement was beginning to build. New bands were springing up, keen to experiment with psychedelic music. John Anderson, a singer with the Warriors, and originally from Lancashire, was drawn to London looking for a new band to join. And I started to work in a bar called the Shask Club, which was just overlooking uh, Warder Street, next door to the famous Marquee Club. And that's where I met Chris. Now, Chris had this band called Mabel Greer's Toy Shop. We were looking to be a kind of a psychedelic wannabe West Coast kind of um, Doors-ish tripped out band. And I said, I'm not going to join any band with that kind of name because, you know, it was like psychedelic time. And uh, that's why we eventually decided to change the name from, you know, the Mabel Greer's Toy Shop into Yes. If there ever was a kind of a, a blueprint for the band, it was uh, to be able to come up with a band that was v d good instrumentally. And, uh, you know, we used to watch Keith Emerson's band, The Nice, play at the Marquee Club, and we were impressed by their musical ability. And so we wanted to have that, and, but we also wanted to have the vocal harmony aspect. We weren't interested in trying to make sort of pop commercial records because there was enough going on in that world and I actually, I, was, I think I was about 27, I felt I was too old to be in a pop band anyway, you know, and I was too small. The lineup of the band was quickly settled on, and driven by John Anderson's ambition, Yes began to make a name for themselves. I've been taunted for being a sort of a Napoleon figure within the band, but that's because I don't play a guitar or I don't play a drum. I, I can only, 
speak or physically sing ideas to everybody and, and come up with a, a passionate thought process. John would usually start with a pro proposition along the lines of, we're going to play this, and if we're going to play this until any of you people think up something that's better than this. And what we would start playing was simply terrible. And after about two minutes, somebody would say, well, look, John, I suppose, you know, we could improve this. If we have to, we could improve this by adding a minor ninth here and moving to the major seventh there. And John wouldn't know what that meant, but anyway, he'd say, well, go on then, do it. Very aggressive. Go on, do it. Yeah, I can hear it now. Nice, by now, had recorded what they described as the world's first instrumental protest song, a version of America from West Side Story. We played it at the Royal Albert Hall. Uh, the event was an anti-apartheid thing, at which the American ambassador was going to be present. So we did America, and we reproduced on stage with blank paper and aerosols the Stars and Stripes, and then set fire to it. just reached down and I set light to it. It was a painting. Um, we'd been going down great until that time. And the balloon went up. <laughs> I think Keith's ban on playing in the Albert Hall was only rescinded about two years ago. The Albert Hall incident aside, Keith Emerson grew frustrated with life in the nice and wanted to try something more ambitious. All ends are painful. And it must have been particularly painful for, for Lee and Brian. Keith had just woke up one Wednesday morning and decided he wanted to do different things with different people, and that, that was that. It was gone. You know. Brian and I had a bit of a shock, really. Lee had a raucous voice, and I was writing melodic material, and I wanted somebody to sing what I was playing on the keyboards. And in order for Lee bless him, to, to sing that. I mean, you'd have to stuff a carrot up his ass to get the, into the octave range that I wanted him to get. What Keith had in mind was a group that would avoid the obvious guitar-based lineup. I looked for a lot of people at that time. I loved the trio format. I was happy with that. I didn't want to work with another guitar player because they always cranked their amplifiers to number 11 and you couldn't be heard. So I was looking for a, a bass player that sang and was an all-rounder. Keith approached several bass players and eventually teamed up with Greg Lake from King Crimson. For a drummer, they turned to Carl Palmer, lately of Atomic Rooster. In comes this bubbly character, very childlike, really, which was endorsed by the fact that on his bass drum he had this little noddy I'm not a Noddy fan, by the way. It just happened to be what was happening at the time. <laughs> and the first thing we played was, um, was this shuffle. And Carl played this shuffle to end all shuffles, you know, like... <coughs> ah, man, it was like, from then he had me. There was a deep love for classical music, which we all had. And we all had other things which we were listening to, sort of as this and the kind of early 60s rock music and jazz. So the ideas that we had as a band were quite eclectic. The band, with its blend of classical and rock music, was an instant success. The first album went to number four in the charts. It took longer for Yes to take off. The band was still working their way towards a settled lineup. We were getting some success, and I was always sort of like very, come on guys, let's rehearse. We've got to rehearse, we've got to get better, because you're only as successful as you are last week, and the next show you put on, you've got to give a bit more. I seem to remember a culture in the band of wanting to get better at everything, and having the best people in the band. And it was all fiercely competitive among the musicians. 
uh, for all, on all instruments. And I seem to remember a culture developing rather like a revolving door, whereas if you could find a better person, you'd have him in the band. You know, there was no employment rights here or severance pay, redundancy money. We didn't have any of those notions at all. You know, if you smelled there was a better guy down the street, you know, who covered a wider material, had a better fuzz box, he was in. The other guy was out. The first guy that was out of the band was guitarist Pete Banks, replaced by Steve Howe. We were quite surprised. I think we all were a little bit shocked because, you know, I got in there and we started playing. It was very good. I mean, something was very right about this. Rick Wakeman, at the time in the Straubs, was widely regarded as a keyboard wizard. Yes, were keen to add his talents to the band. He had a pretty high profile, and so I said, well, let's nick him then. <laughs> I remember the very first show he played. Bill Brew the drummer came up and said to Chris, you missed out such and such. Chris said, no I didn't, you didn't listen to what I played. They had a blazing row which culminated in Bill hitting him, you know, giving him a, <laughs> a right chinner. And I thought, oh she's great, I've just joined this band, giving out all my sessions and everything, the bass, uh, the drummer's just hit the bass player, and that means it's all going to fold up and finish. But apparently that was the norm. There was a sort of new ideology that keyboards could actually bring more to the band than just the organ and the piano. There were string sounds, there were choirs and various other sounds. And these were the sort of colors that I started to feel very strongly that Yes could reinterpret through rock and roll, put it on stage and actually perform mini symphonies on stage. That's what I started to dream. As well as his symphonic ambitions, what characterized Yes's music was John Anderson's highly distinctive lyrics. The lyrics on the whole were nothing I was interested in, apart until the hate mail came. <laughs> until people said, what on earth is this guy Anderson singing about? He wrote lyrics that nobody in the world could understand. I, I was concerned whether John understood them, actually. These are all lyrics that I would just write down. I'm thinking, what are these lyrics? These are pretty wild. After a while, I found myself just singing a lot of his lyrics, not understanding what the hell we were all singing about, but it, they sounded good. The album that really marked Yes's emergence as a major band in the UK and US was Fragile. It spawned the unexpected US hit single, Roundabout. The big test for the band was to follow up such a success. Let's not go and try and make another fragile because once you've made something that works, you can't really go back to that to revisit it because then you're you're stopping. You you, you just start start getting into the okay. We're, we we got to have another hit record. So why we did why what we did we just jumped into close to the edge, which was a 20 minute piece of music and two 10 minute pieces of music. Of course, the whole thing took forever and a day, it seemed to me, and I would uh, crash out on the sofa at the back of the control booth, you know, at about midnight, um, bored to death with the intricate noodling on the knobs, you know, that Chris Squire seemed to have endless energy for, along with Eddie Offord. And I'd wake up at about 4 a.m. and they'd still be there, you know, still doing these small, fine adjustments and editing for the 19th time some cymbal note to some bass drum note. Bill was a great drummer. Great, great drummer, and very much at that particular time a the precise Yes drummer, uh, and perfect for the sort of stuff that Yes were doing. Um, and at the end of Close to the Edge, he just suddenly announced, I'm leaving, I'm joining Robert Fripp. And he said he wanted to move on and work with King Crimson, and that was, in a way, it's like being in, a, in Manchester United and the guy wants to go and play for Arsenal. You know, it's like, come on, you know, you're with Manchester United, and you, we've just scored a goal. Bill was replaced by Alan White, and yes, continued. 
While in the band, Rick was also pursuing a solo career. His projects were lengthy semi-orchestral pieces. The first album was called The Six Wives of Henry VIII. When I finished it, I proudly took it along to i &M Records in London, who played it and said, yeah, we'll bring it back when you've got the words on. And I said, there aren't any words. And they said, this is an instrumental album of six pieces, all too long to be played on the radio. Are you off your head? And I said, no. <laughs> Every review, with the exception of about two, stank. I mean, Melody Maker reviewed it and said it was ideal for people who wanted to get out of the lift quickly. It ended up selling 11 million copies. Back in Yes, they were about to start work on the LP Tales from Topographic Oceans. It was going to be a double album based on a set of Hindu texts. To do justice to such a concept, John Anderson wanted to experiment with a new recording environment. I wanted to record it in the middle of the woods. It was to do with the earth, it was to do with the ancient and the revealing of all that is, and trying to remember where we're from, why we're here, and various other, the ritual of life. So I said, why don't we pitch a tent in the middle of a forest and run wires and record in the middle of the forest, especially midnight when the owls are out and the, s the wind is howling and we're making... Uh, John, get a life. They decided instead to record in Willesden, North London. But John had not given up on the idea of creating a rural environment. It was like a farmyard. There was like white fences. I mean, the amps were all on, on hay and things like that. My keyboards were all on bales of hay. I had the only keyboards that had to go back for repair because they, because they had earwigs and, and animals and things and worms crawling in them. Uh, but the classic of all was there was this huge, full-size, cardboard cut-out cow with an electric motor with a tail that went up and down and others that went up and down and that was there in the middle. It just looked like a complete farmyard. <laughs> The album marked a turning point in Yes's fortunes. Critics hated it, accusing the band of self-indulgence. It was an opinion shared by Rick Wakeman. He was thinking, why am I doing this, you know, this large-scale piece of music, which may, maybe critics don't like and the fans maybe don't like too much. And he started to waver and then the band started, it was like a boat going like this through rough waters for about two years. I went out and did the tour. And I really tried very hard, but it was, uh, I mean, to me it was about as, you know, about as exciting as a, you know, I don't know, as a, as a wooden chair tester with piles. I think every night I said, please get uh, the second movement of Topographic right, because it's his keyboard solo. Please get it right. Why don't you just learn it and please get it right? I must have asked him a dozen times and he just could not come to terms with what he played on the album so he didn't perform it as we all understood it to be from a musical standpoint. That became a problem that he wouldn't face and I kept pushing him to face it all the way through the tour to the point they said, John, I've had enough of you, you're driving me crazy, I'm leaving. And I said, oh, sorry, I didn't mean... <laughs> of course, you know, it's too late. You know, I pushed him over the edge. Rick left to be replaced by Patrick Moraz. By now, ELP, like Yes, were a major stadium band Excess in both the music and the presentation was the order of the day. The band felt they were at their creative peak by the time of their LP, Brain Salad Surgery. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. We're so glad you could attend. Come inside, come inside. It was one of those great periods in the life of Emerson, Lake and Palmer where one was being experimental and nearly everything you experimented with, whether it be the electronic drums or backwards table, that what, whatever we did at the time worked and sounded great to us. My 
I had a stainless steel drum set made. Um, British Steel supplied these shells. It was like half a ton, this drum set made. And you had to reinforce the stage to take the drums, you know, because they were so heavy. Yes, it was larger than life, that's for sure. You know, to have three articulated trucks with your names painted on the top of them, was, you know, that was considered to be really decadent. This excess was eventually to lead to the band's downfall. But in the mid-1970s, grand concepts and stage designs were common in the world of prog rock. Rick Wakeman, since leaving Yes, had pursued his solo career. His album, Journey to the Centre of the Earth, had been a big hit, but the effects of touring and lifestyle brought him close to death. I was under pressure to produce a new album. Uh, I was an extreme party animal, and basically, uh, after the performance of Journey to the Centre of the Earth at Crystal Palace Bowl, that's when I had a heart attack, and that was, I was flat on my back. I can remember the doctor and my management at the record company all standing around the bed and saying, right, uh, you know, your career's over, that's it, you're finished, you know, you've got to retire. I mean, 26 or 25 I was. <coughs> so you've got to retire, you've got to retire, do no more work, do nothing. Rick ignored this advice and started thinking about his next project. Not commonly known was I'd written most of King Arthur in hospital. Even though it's about the myths and legends of King Arthur and the, and the Round Table, it's extremely autobiographical. There is an awful lot of me that is interwoven into both the words and the music. Because I, I did come out wondering if it would be the last thing I would ever do. Rick recovered and decided to take the album on the road. I had a meeting at my manager's office, a guy called Brian Lane and Harvey Goldsmith. And they were sitting there and I said, I want to do it, I want to do it at the Empire Pool, Wembley. And Harvey said, you can't. And I said, why not? He said, because um, you can't, because it's, it's going to be frozen over because they've got the ice follies going in. He said, what are you going to do with all the ice? I said, we'll do it on ice. <laughs> People thought I was absolutely mad, but it's still the thing that people remember. Because of the ice, we've only seat 9,000 a night, so we had 27,000 people in there. But if I could have a pound for the other 100,000 who said they saw it, it would be wonderful. I'd love to do it again. Rick's elaborate stage shows, which he partly funded himself, were to lead him into serious financial problems. But as the decade wore on, prog rock generally was facing a crisis. Critics and public alike were turning against the ostentation of the music and stage shows. Yes, we're well aware of the problem. One year we were the People's Band in the NME. Big headline, yes, the People's Band. And I went, hey, I'm really proud of that, People's Band. I think it was only a year and a half later, in the same paper, we were rock dinosaurs. So you can see there was a very quick change, for, as there is with a successful act in the way that you're appreciated and loved and enjoyed for being there, to suddenly, oh, God, we've had this. They're doing the same damn thing. We loved it last year, but we hate it now. The rock critics, um, I believe, always have an element of truth in everything they've ever said about me, yes, or any band. Elements of truth. Sometimes it gets venomous. The band did take some notice of the criticism and return to a more straightforward style. But tastes were changing and the one-time giants of prog rock were finding life difficult. ELP decided to take a full orchestra on tour, but this time overreached themselves. It was successful, people came along to see it, but it was costly, and we couldn't play in you know, any bigger places. Than, it just The mathematics, the economics of it weren't worked out accurately. And if there was one empty seat, it would make a difference. I remember we got to the probably the tenth concert and we called the orchestra into a room and we said to them we can't afford to pay you anymore in actual fact um, we had to go on tour after that to pay for the cost of that orchestra we went on tour for about four weeks as a trio because it cost so much having had a taste of um, playing with the big sound and it was limited to just the three of us again. I mean, I just lost hope, really, I think, for a time. We didn't actually sort of say we're going to break up. We didn't have a fight. We didn't sort of fall out with each other. 
We just, we just went away. Yes, now with Rick Wakeman back in the band, they're having their own problems. 1979 turned out to be a particularly bad year for them. Life went horribly wrong for Yes in 79. I mean, really, really horribly wrong. We did a tour of America. Punk was in big. Um, we were sort of dinosaurs. There's a whole new brigade of press writers and reporters that uh, you know, quite rightly had their own style of music that they liked. And so it was goodbye to the dinosaurs of rock, of which we fitted the bill perfectly. We went to France, to Paris, to record. And John and I had written a lot of songs together. And there was a lot of animosity amongst the other members that John and I had written a lot together. And basically, they never turned up at the studio. Me and Rick started drinking Calvados. Because the producer and other members of the band weren't turning up on time. So we just go to the bar and... John and I must have done a bottle of this stuff. And it can also make you quite depressed. And John and I got really quite depressed and so I cried on each other's shoulders. And John saying, this is not the band that I love, this is not the band that I want. And I'm going, one with you, John. I think we'd lost respect for each other. So it's a very simple process. We'd all lost respect for each other. And then we broke up. I still remember you said the departure of two key figures, John Anderson and Rick Wakeman, left the rest of the band in limbo. By one of those quirks of fate, they were about to meet up with a duo known as Buggles, who'd just had a hit. About six months in, after you know having this huge hit with Video Killed the Radio Star, Jeffrey and I decided that we needed a manager, like acts generally do. They signed with Brian Lane, who also managed Jess. Soon, the two groups were working out of the same office. I think they were a bit directionless, because they were just rehearsing as a three-piece, and they were recording, actually, in the, in the studio in London. And, you know, you can only go so far as a, as a rhythm section. Trevor Horn and Jeff Downs were both big fans of Yes, and when invited to Chris Squire's house, Trevor took the opportunity to offer him a new song. At some point in the evening, I picked up a guitar and said, you know, I've got a song that might be quite good for Yes. You know, I was, you know, I was sort of hustling a bit. I played him a bit of a song. And he said, wow, you sound, when you sing, you sound a little bit like John Anderson. And then he said, why don't you come down to the rehearsal rooms and uh, let's try the song. So I said, well, will John Anderson be there? He said, maybe, maybe. There was Alan, Steve and myself uh, with, without a keyboard player and a singer and, and, and essentially that's what the Buggles were and we were in the same office. So although when I first suggested, well, I, when I said, well, look, this is obvious what we should do is get together with these guys that obviously know how to write a good tune. Somebody suggested that we should go in and record it. And I was still saying, where's John Anderson? What's, you know, what's happening? Where's John Anderson? because he's obviously going to have to sing it. It was round about then that I found out that in actual fact John Anderson had left the band. Yes! We went from being session musicians to pop stars to rock stars and, you know, the movement was, was very rapid. Yes had been booked to play a major tour of the States, but Trevor felt uncomfortable in the role of the singer in this lineup. I agreed to do it, really, because I thought that, you know, you're being stupid. It's only music, and, you know, nobody's, you never get a chance like this in your life. This is, in fact, if I, if I look back on it, that's what Chris did it to me, by saying, haven't you got the bottle to do it? Well, Trevor Horn was very, very nervous. I mean, I, I have to say, to this day, he, he did a remarkable job, considering that we were... Uh, you know, he hadn't really toured on that kind of a level before, and then all of a sudden we were doing four nights at Madison Square Garden, uh, which had been sold out for the last six months, and, 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 you know, prior to people even knowing that John had left. They made me sing high like John Anderson. I had to sing everything really high. 
because as Chris pointed out to me, you know, when rock bands are playing very loud, the singer's got to sing high, otherwise no one will ever hear him. So I had to sing high. Alan, Chris and I just felt we're perpetuating something and it's going on exactly the same, even though John Anson's not there, even though Rick Wakeman's not there. It's the same, we thought, until we got to England, you know, and in England the people started saying, uh, like, shouting stuff out, you know. Because there's quite a lot of silences in Yes's music. So it all comes down nice and quietly and things like And You and I, some of the early songs. And suddenly, you somebody shouts, fuck off. <laughs> right in the middle of it, that can be a little bit disheartening. The touring experience was the final nail in the coffin. The band met to discuss their future. After the discussion, only Jeff and I were in the band. I mean, I can't tell you what was said in that discussion, but a discussion went down and three of them left, and Jeff and I sat there and said, well, we've got yes. And he looked at me and said, yeah, well, I've got to do the next uh, Buggles record now. So I said, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. He said, I, I felt like I had the whole of yes to myself if I wanted it, or would I do it with Jeff? I just didn't want it. I mean, I'd had 10 years of chopping and changing members, and suddenly everything stopping to me was the only kind of peace I could relate to. So yes went into limbo. Steve Howe joined up with Carl Palmer, Jeff Downs, and former King Crimson and UK member John Wetton to form a prog rock supergroup, Asia. When you've got four people from well-respected bands, it's not like the old days of, you know, the band growing up together, going up the M1 in the back of a transit. You know, it wasn't like that. You know, this was a, this was a band that there'd be, you know, an Aston Martin, a Porsche and a, and a Rolls Royce outside the rehearsal rooms, you know. Aisha was, was very, um, we've all been there, done it, got the T-shirt type of band, you know. Uh, nobody really wanted to listen to each other because, to anyone else, because we all felt that we knew. The intention for Asia was really to be a very efficient, successful band with a crossover between progressive rock and pop. The album was a massive success in the US. For Steve Howe, it justified having broken away from Yes. Why Asia was so important for me was it, it was without Yes. You know what I mean? It was like my own sort of opportunity to say, well, actually, guys, you know, I've kind of made it without you. It took me by surprise. I didn't, I didn't know how... Um, successful it's going to be. I think it took everyone by surprise. We were booked into colleges and little halls and <clears throat> by the end of the first tour it was obvious that <laughs> we were going to do a lot bigger than that. With uh, Asia being, you know, a progressive rock band, it was about the amount of gear you could have on stage. And Steve used to have probably about 50 guitars, you know, and um, John Wenton used to have about 10 basses. That was the image, really. It wasn't about, you know, what you looked like or anything like that. It was, it was a display of gear. While Asia continued a career as pop progressive rockers, other ex-members of Yes were trying to revive their careers. Chris Squire and Alan White had teamed up with a young guitarist, Trevor Rabin, in a band called Cinema. Chris wanted Trevor Horn to produce them. It turned out to be a difficult job for Trevor. Halfway through the album, it became painfully obvious to me that Trevor Rabin wasn't yet ready to be the, the lead singer in a, in a band and that he was, it wasn't going to work, that one of two things was going to happen. Either they'd have to call it yes again and get John Anderson back or Chris Squire would have to sing. And Chris didn't want to sing. And after various sort of terrible arguments and whatever, John Anderson was, was brought back in, so I finally got to meet him. <laughs> Chris actually gave me a call when I was in London. I was doing some work with Van Gelis, and he rang me up and said, would you listen to some new music we're doing? And I said, yeah, of course, what's happening? And he brought me the, the backing tracks and some of the songs to 90125. And I said, that's really, really good stuff. And he said, would you sing it? And I said, well, you know, Chris, if I sing it, what's the band called? He said, Cinema. Cinema. Well, I know I, if I sing on this, it's going to sound like yes, you know. So is that the... Is that the deal? You want to get yes going again? They said, yeah. So okay then. 
Both the album, 90125, and the single, Owner of a Lonely Heart, were hits. Yes, we're back on the map. It meant the band was yes again, although it was never quite the yes that it was before, you know, because John wasn't ever quite in charge again, because Trevor Rabin was much too forceful and had written the hit song. So, you know, these are the kind of dynamics that change inside bands. It's as though I'd been pigeonholed as just be the singer, John, and don't make waves, and just be happy to be in the band and get your check at the end of the day, and don't make waves. You don't want to hear what I've got to say, oh, OK. What am I doing in the band? John left Yes one more time. In the mid-1980s, ELP reformed. Carl Palmer was still in Asia, so the band got noted rock drummer Cozy Powell to replace him. We did an album, which was pretty well received in the States. Touch and Go was a single, which did very well over there. We did an American tour. We did Madison Square Gardens and Meadowlands sold out. I mean, fantastic business on the east coast and the further west we went the business wasn't so good and we started off with about 18 trucks full of gear and as the tour progressed the truck one truck would go and another week would go another truck would go and the show started getting smaller and smaller but it was great fun but in the end <laughs> egos again keith and greg at that point whether they like each other now i don't know but they really were going through lots of personal problems Muggins is stuck in the middle of these two. When that fell apart, then I really was disillusioned. By this point, I thought, well, I'm running out of bands here. There's not too many left. <laughs> so ELP folded again. At the end of the decade, four ex-members of Yes came together in a band called Anderson Bruford Wakeman Howe. This led to a legal wrangle with the current lineup of Yes. While we were doing ABWH, you had Chris and Trevor and the management trying to sue us for, for, for applying the name Yes to who we were. When we toured Europe, the promoter actually changed the whole way that the writing was written, and it was called An Evening of Yes Music Plus with a Anderson Bruford Wakeman Howe. And it ended up looking like Yes with ABWH. Because we have four guys in the band that used to be in Yes. So we never said we were Yes, but the record company did. <laughs> so. Every time we played a Yes track, it was like ovation. And we did a few, you know, we did ABWH, a couple of Yes. And then we did the song And You and I. The sound was deafening. I've never, to a point where I, I thought I'd have to put my hand over my ears, it was that loud. It was flattened by a blast of, of whooping and hollering like you've never heard in your life. I could hear what that was. That was because we played yes and we, we are yes, we were yes. There then followed an ambitious scheme to bring the two groups together to record and tour. The ludicrous plan uh, arose whereby we should somehow marry the other half of yes that was feeling jilted in the west coast of America and that we'd sort of halfway create an album here and then halfway send it over to them and halfway they would overdub onto it and it would turn into some work of art. I was hoping that one song here I could get Rick to play on and then maybe Steve might play on and then into like I felt like I was a bee I was getting the pollen from here and the pollen from there and sort of mixing it together trying to make this union. The unusual recording process that followed did not please all members of the band. And when the album came out, because of computers, they changed all the parts that I'd played. I didn't recognise any of the things that I'd done. Um, the producer had, had basically invited all his mates to play on the album as well. I mean, uh, I mean, the only person who didn't play on the album I think, was my dog. It was probably not only the most dishonest title that uh, that I've ever had the privilege of playing drums underneath, but the single worst album I've ever recorded. It was called Union in the album. I called it Onion because it made me cry every time I heard it. It doesn't rain, it doesn't, doesn't rain, true. Having said all that, 
We got together and went out and did a tour that was my most enjoyable Yes tour that I've ever done. It was absolutely fantastic. It was Nostalgia Rules OK. This reunion lineup was not intended to last beyond one tour. I can't go on indefinitely with the same four guys that I grew up with, you know, which I think was what you were supposed to do in rock music. You know, you were supposed to somehow um, slit your wrists, mingle blood, stay in the same group forever, achieve a huge bank robbery style success, um, and then retire to grow vegetables. That was not what I had in mind at all. Other Yes members felt differently, and the band continues to play and record. I'm still amazed that I'm making music. I'm still amazed that we're still together, trying to get it right. I think, as a whole, the members of Yes have coped with the, you know, what is nearly 30 years of success now, but pretty well, actually. You know, I don't think anyone's really gone quite that far out, though we've had the occasional sound engineer that, that's taken a, a little, you know, excursion. I went to do an interview once and somebody said, we think all the stuff you do is pompous, uh, it's overblown, it's just full of unbelievably fast runs and, 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 and I went, yeah, it's right, it's good, isn't it?